Okay, everyone, I'm so excited about today. I went out on a whim and I decided to reach out to Giannis and Marie because they are the authors of one of my most favorite books. It's newer and it's got all the latest research in it. Uh, they are the authors of Effective Teaching Strategies for Dyscalculia and Learning Difficulties in Mathematics Perspectives from Cognitive Neuroscience. And inside, it's got wonderful, wonderful descriptions and images to help you really understand what helps children. And so I reached out to them to ask if they would come and talk a little bit about it. And I realized that one interview would never cover all the questions I have, but we're going to do our best today. We're going to start with just a few things out of this book because there's so much that we could cover. But welcome to Giannis and Marie. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for the invitation. Yes, our yes. pleasure. Oh, yes, I'm so excited. Um, so Giannis, you're in Greece and Marie, you're in Belgium right now? Yes. Yes, thank you. So I appreciate you making time for us later in your evening um, to join us here over in the US. So let's talk a little bit about your backgrounds. Um, let's see, Giannis, tell us about you and a little bit about a bio about you. Okay, I'm, um, I'm a mathematician. Uh, so I hold a degree in mathematics and master in mathematics. And then I did my PhD on uh, I don't know, maybe numerical cognition and uh, something like this. And um, then I met Marie Pascal at her university in uh, Belgium, where I did a postdoc and we developed together the math protest, the full version. Um, and um, yes, I work with um, in University of Athens and University of um, Nicosia and uh, teach uh, learning difficulties in, um, in mathematics. And um, uh, I do assessment uh, on, uh, for children with learning difficulties and supervise teachers that they deliver their intervention and training teachers around the world on these um, issues. That's so fantastic. Uh, what, what about you, Marie? I am a psychologist. I've been trained as a neuropsychologist. I did my PhD in uh, neuropsychology with an uh, adult patient who, after a brain damage, could not anymore uh, process numbers. Some of them could not read numbers anymore. Some of them could not calculate anymore. And, uh, and then I moved into the field of uh, child numerical development. Uh, and I'm doing research in that field since about maybe 20 years now. Oh, wow. I, I've been doing very, what we call fundamental research, um, examining theoretical questions, but I've always been interested in having an impact on the field, on, on the clinic. So I opened a clinic in the university uh, for uh, people who have learning disabilities. And there I work with uh, child neuropsychologists, with speech therapists. And uh, in that place, I have the occasion to assess some children with learning disabilities in mathematics or to guide the clinicians uh, in the interpretation of the assessment, in building uh, remediation programs and so on. Wonderful. I'm so excited that you two have chosen to study this field. I feel like I am that child that struggled in school greatly and they didn't necessarily understand why, right? But I was shy, so I didn't necessarily let people know how much I was struggling. Um, so what brought you two together? How did you meet? And what made you go, hey, let's work on this together? Actually, I met Yanis in a conference. I don't remember where it was. In in UK, in London. Yeah, in London. Yeah. And uh, I was um, interested in the way he was uh, really um, uh, having good ideas about real uh, tools for learning mathematics and helping children with learning difficulties and. Mm -hmm. I was uh, one of the keynote of that conference. And then uh, months later, he called me and asked if he could visit me in Belgium and start a collaboration. Oh, that's amazing. 
That's amazing. And Giannis, how did you decide that this is where you wanted to spend your career? Um, you told me regarding the the relation with Marie Pascal, or yeah. Like, so you made the decision uh, to choose to study numeracy and learning differences. Ah, okay. And all that. So I'm curious, yeah. how did you get there? Okay. Uh, it is a, because of a personal experience. So uh, I am dyslexic, but I, I realize that I'm dyslexic. I diagnosed when I was uh, 20, 21 years old. Mm. So I was very good in mathematics. Uh, I wasn't very good in literacy and, you know, in, in spelling and all of this. So for me, it's one way to be good in mathematics. I was why I, I, I like mathematics and science. And when I got, I get, I entered the university at the third years. I was undergraduate student. My younger sister diagnosed with dyslexia. Mm. So then I realized because you know, twenty years ago it wasn't very, very uh, uh, well known, at least in, in Greece. So uh, I realized that I have the same symptoms, and, and then I diagnosed as a dyslexic as well, and the ADHD. So um, uh, then. I decided that uh, I was very good in mathematics and I, I uh, reading about the issue, I, I informed that many dyslexics are not good at mathematics. So for me, it's very strange why they're not good at mathematics. <laughs> and so I decided to share my experience, my personal ways of uh, mm -hmm. compensating all these difficulties that based on memory and uh, wanted to uh, do research on this and uh, discover other methods of helping and assessing students that are uh, um, based on um, a research findings. So that's why I started to, to do this. That's wonderful. I'm so glad that you are representative of a lot of the people you're helping. I think that's amazing. And Marie, what about you? What just drew you to number research? Well, I don't have any learning disabilities. I was actually very good in maths. Um, genius. My math teacher <laughs> wanted me to be a mathematician, but um, that was not my personal appeal. I wanted to be more in relationship with people. And, uh, but when I was studying psychology, I have been very impressed by the power of the cognitive psychology the, the methodology, the, the methods they use to address uh, questions, to test hypotheses. And in particular, I was very impressed by my course of uh, adult neuropsychology, uh, where you analyze uh, the cognitive profile of a patient. And then from that, you find dissociation. And from that, you build theoretical models of how our brain is functioning. And so that's uh, by this way that I've been attracted uh, to neuropsychology and I made my PhD in neuropsychology. And uh, during my PhD, I was uh, going to the hospital and then examining some patients who lost some of their numerical abilities. And then I was uh, assessing them for like maybe 10 sessions and uh, building new assessment tool, observation uh, uh, situation and so on. And then after that one, finally, I got a clear picture of their very specific difficulties. I was tailoring a specific remediation program perfectly adapted to the patient. But then after maybe five, six uh, session of uh, remediation, they told me, well, you know, I have this problem in map, but I have so many more problems with my language, with my memory. And so I want to put all my energy on those clinical uh, remediation session. And I was feeling quite frustrated and a little bit useless. Mm. And then I met a woman, uh, uh, who was addressed to me by the neurologist because she had a very um, big difficulties with mathematics, but her brain was perfect. And so there was no brain lesion. And when we were speaking with her, she was telling us that her difficulties were there forever. I mean, since mm -hmm. her childhood. 
And so it was the first time I met someone with what we call a developmental problem, developmental dyscalculia. And um, I was very um, sad when I was hearing her story, all the difficulties she had, nobody acknowledged her difficulties. She didn't even obtain it, uh, the, what we call the primary school uh, mm -hmm. uh, diploma. Mm -hmm. So of course she couldn't go into interesting uh, studies to learn a profession that she would like. Uh, I mean, the, the opportunities were very weak. And, uh, and then I understood that uh, if you have a developmental dyscalculia, it can really change all your life. Yes. First of all, your school experience, but also your professional life. Then I met another woman. She said um, she, she was uh, going to see a clinical psychologist because she, she was in her 40s and um, she had several problems, I would say, affective problem. And uh, she told me, well, I've been broad and everybody was always telling me that I am stupid. And so I would like to know uh, whether I'm stupid. I would like you to test my IQ, my uh, intellectual uh, caution. And when I tested her, she was not, uh, she was perfectly norm normally clever, but she had a very severe dyscalculia. And for her, it was really a relief to have this diagnosis, mm -hmm. to discover that she, she was, uh, absolutely normal, she was not stupid, but she just had learning disabilities, specifically in mathematics. Yeah. And all the cases with uh, adults uh, with dyscalculia that I met uh, made me really realize how important it is to contribute to this field. When yeah. I started like um, 20 or 30 years ago, there were nearly no literature on the topic. And uh, so I wanted to really contribute to discover what is this problem? How can we assess and detect those people? How can we help them? And I think that it can really make big changes in someone's life. I think so too. And here in the US, you'll hear a lot of people say, well, I'm bad at math and that's okay. They just kind of accept it. But you and I both know it can really negatively impact your life. Can you describe some of the things that these adults that were describing to you, what it's like to live with some of these issues? Mm -hmm. uh, like the, first of all, you don't have a lot of money because usually mm -hmm. you don't have a very good job. Uh, secondly, um, people say that any time in the discussion, there will be numbers or calculation involved often they feel bad or they feel anxious. Uh, when they're going to the shops, if you give money, you have to prepare the bills. Mm -hmm. And uh, except if you pay with a card, now we all pay with cards, but otherwise they have difficulties knowing how many bills they have to show which bills. And when they get the money back, they cannot check whether it's right or wrong. Correct. Um, if you follow a recipe, for instance, you have a recipe for six people, you have to cook for three people, then you have to adjust the quantities. Um, but it can also be in terms of uh, another woman I met, she, she came because she said, uh, my daughter is nine years old and now I'm not able anymore to do the homework with her in mathematics because I'm it's too difficult for me. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And she had never dared to speak about her difficulty to her husband, for instance. And when we tested her, she had many difficulties in different areas of mathematics. But one of these difficulties was that she couldn't read correctly the, the numbers, the big numbers, like four or five digit numbers. She couldn't read it correctly. Mm. And she couldn't understand the corresponding magnitude. Absolutely. So like uh, if you have to pay a car or something, you need to have a ma magnitude representation of these big numbers. Yes, absolutely. I can relate to that. I know for me as an adult, if information is presented to me in a table, for example, I have a harder time 
making sense of these numbers. However, if someone takes the time to turn it into a graph or some sort of line plot, I start to understand. I can see the magnitude better, right? Um, and so being able to reason like that is so, so important and something that can be taught and learned. But I think that's the exciting news is that we, your book shows a way that we can teach these. Now, it's not the same way for everybody, but you give so many great ideas to help reach these students. Um, so let's turn to the book and talk a little bit more about that. So in the beginning of the book, I felt like I could highlight every page. I just was resonating with everything you were saying. I'm so excited. Um, but you were describing that there are four main difficulties that are kind of found in people that have dyscalculia and math learning disabilities. You mentioned the approximate number system, subitizing, counting and enumeration, and the number position on the line. And so I would love to talk about each of those things because a lot of our audience are parents and those phrases might have little meaning to no meaning for them. And so I would love to have you share a little bit more about what those are. Well, by me, <laughs> um, I would say that mathematics is a little bit like a castle of cards. So you have a first layer of cards and then other cards and other. And if, and usually people with dyscalculia, they already have difficulties with the first layer. Mm -hmm. so when they start to learn the second layer, they cannot learn it correctly. So they, you first need to fix the first layer, but then they will also help you. They will also need usually help also to build a second layer and help to build a third layer. So the problem, you can already see problems at the first layer. It's not the only problem that they have, but it's so the first things that you can see. And um, uh, among these, uh, among these, so we have the, ENS, approximate number system. It's a system actually that is not exclusively human. It's a system that is shared uh, with other, with many other uh, animal species. And it's our ability to quickly have a representation of the magnitude or the set size of big collections. Like if you have, I show you a pile of uh, apple, that high or another pile that high, you know that there are more apples here than here. You don't have to count them. You just see in a glimpse that mm -hmm. there is a larger amount here than uh, there. But the limit of this system is that it's very approximate. So you may see quickly the difference between 30 dots and 15 dots, but if I show you 30 dots and 25 dots, you may be completely at random if you need to select the bigger one. Mm -hmm. You will need to count, otherwise you will uh, just be at random. They look too similar. Yes. Yeah. So that's the first system, the ANS, the approximate number system. And this animal part, I would say that we have uh, might be, but it's a question, might be like the foundation of all the mathematics that we've learned, that we are learning. Um, the second system is the subitizing system. The subitizing system is our ability to very quickly, and that's why we call it subitizing because it's subito, very, very rapid. Mm -hmm. uh, you can rapidly uh, detect precisely the numerosity of very small sets. If I show you, show you two dots or four dots, you don't need to count. You will know exactly and very precisely that there are two or four dots. So this system is very fast, very precise, but the problem is that it can only be used for very small sets. Right. If you present me six dots, then I might say there is six or seven, maybe I would say five or it may be uh, error prone. Mm -hmm. And then uh, in our culture and in most of the human culture, but not all, we, we also have a, a number names mm -hmm. and a counting list. So we have names to say one, to say two, three, four, five, six, and so on. 
And this counting list is very important because it will allow us to make a correspondence, a one-to-one -one correspondence between the word and the item of, in a set. So to enumerate the set, counting the items, and then you can say exactly how many items are in the set. It takes more time, but it's very precise. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so the, the, the number words uh, is a symbolic system that we learn. It's a cultural system. And it allows you to go much beyond the approximate number system because it will allow you to create an exact number representation. And then you know if I tell you 14 or 15, which is big, bigger, you know it's 15. You don't have to count, uh, and you are perfectly correct if I use number words or Arabic number mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. as well. That's wonderful. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> then maybe I, I finish with the last one. Yes. Uh, the number positioning on the line. Mm -hmm. Usually it's a task actually that uh, has been uh, developed by uh, Bob Sigler. Uh, it's uh, you present the child with the line with two numbers at each extremities, like for instance, zero and 100. Mm -hmm. And you present a number, either a verbal number or a number written in Arabic digit, let's say 14. And you ask the child to say on this number, on this line that is not graduated, uh, where should the 40 be? So in a way, it's a task that allows to see what is your understanding of the symbolic numbers that is presented? And how do you make the correspondence, the mapping between that symbolic numbers and an analog representation of the numerical magnitude? Mm, yes. And this task is a very uh, strong predictor of mathematic abilities. That makes a lot of sense. And, um... <clears throat> Giannis, how would you recommend that you help a child build that number line? Uh, get used to putting numbers on a number line. Yeah, yeah number line is, a, as Marie Pascal does, is a very, very strong prediction of a numerical uh, development because it's combined many things. So uh, the number understanding, uh, if you are able to um, uh, do a corresponding between the number and the particular length, Mm -hmm. And also, you need also reason, reasonal skills to, for example, cut the number line from zero to hundred to ten pieces or to half or to a quarter. So it's it's a very good um, uh, prediction, and you can use the number lines in any in any age. For example, in very small children, you can use zero to ten, and then zero to hundred, zero to thousand, or later on, uh, can use also uh, rational numbers fractions mm -hmm. or decimal so it's a really really good um, uh, measurement to uh, to understand uh, the number sense of the, of uh, chile until this age um regarding the previous uh, the previous uh, measures uh, for me it's are not are not very fun <laughs> i'm not very fun on sabotaging and all this because um, we have done, um, we have administered such a task to four different populations. We mm -hmm. did this research with Marie Pascal, and we didn't find significant correlation between sabotaging or um, uh, approximate number system uh, with a, a mathematical um, achievement. So we found very, very small um, uh, correlation. And can be explained from different aspects because in number sense or in sabotaging, also the visual special um, skills are involved, and there are other characteristics that you measure uh, except the the numerosity alone. Mm -hmm. So that's why maybe we didn't found such a correlation. So from my point of view, uh, since when I, we want to help a dyscalculic student or a student with learning difficulties in mathematics, I like to see, you know, the, the, the whole picture and I want to make this, the children to um, um, feel um, uh, successful in the mathematics at school. So um, doing that 
particular intervention to increase uh, the, um, uh, the achievement in subitizing and uh, in uh, approximate numbers in them. So far, I'm not convinced that this work because it's the, the, uh, the way to, um, uh, to see this, uh, this intervention uh, um, that can help um, to make the student uh, be successful in, uh, in mathematics in school, it's very, very long way. So we don't have that luxury to, to do a particular intervention on such a specific things and yeah. uh, see an effect in, at school. Of course, when you do a study, you can train the student on this, and you see, and um, uh, you, you see that they, they achieve, you see a progress. Mm -hmm. But uh, we don't have a studies that says that if you train the, the student in a, in a subitizing, then you can see an effect at um, general, uh, you know, development in uh, mathematical skills. Mm -hmm. So I hope to have um, studies on this and. Uh, convince me that it, it, it really yes uh, please do study because i i yeah. think that's a valid concern that you have and something that we've talked about as a team when we were reading about kind of how no one's able to really prove that that's a really effective intervention one of my team members went and she took a subitizing test to see if she would get flagged as having math issues and she's a very gifted mathematician in my opinion and she did she got flagged for probably some of those reasons that you're talking about like visual spatial reasoning may have been a little bit off and so we both were talking about how um yeah we can see like maybe some of the false positives that could occur in a study like that but i would love to study it more because i think we see with kids if we're combining you know symbolic Arabic numbers with the subitizing in like a dice or domino pattern, those things together help the child make progress. But there aren't as many studies about that. And so I'm raising my hand. If you need people to help, let us know. <laughs> we have a lot of students with exactly the demographic you're looking for. Um, but I would love to hear from you, Marie, like a little bit more about the subitizing, because you looked at that, about um, the possibility that it's, is it accessing numerical magnitude or the representation of the symbolic code rather than those dot patterns. So could you share a little bit more about that? Because you do go into that in the book. So there are uh, theoretical questions of uh, about what will be the more initial uh, numerical uh, step that would already show uh, difficulties uh, in children with dyscalculia. And so one of the question is, do people with dyscalculia have uh, an impaired approximate number system? If yes, you could actually expect that maybe some animals also are dyscalculic. <laughs> that would be mm, funny. That's interesting. I hadn't thought of that. Yeah. Um, and there are many um, arguments about that uh, in the literature and the uh, uh, many theoretical debates and so on. And, um, but as uh, Yanis was saying, I'm not sure this is a good avenue for people who are wanting to help uh, children with dyscalculia. Mm -hmm. um, and also there are many problems with this approximate number system because one of the question is, when you see two sets of objects and quickly you can decide which one is bigger, usually there are many other factors implied. Maybe this set contains larger items or takes a larger amount of the space sure. or is darker if the da dots are dark and all kind of other things that leads you to have a sense of magnitude. So it's a sense of magnitude, but maybe not specifically a sense of number magnitude. Yes. Other kind of magnitude as well, which actually interact with one another. Mm. And subitizing, subitizing has been shown to be important uh, when children need to learn the meaning of the first words, first number words, when you have to understand what does it mean one, two, three, four, it helps them if they can subitize. 
yes. then they can make the mapping between are ah, these two when they I take them together it corresponds to the word two and mm -hmm. these three when they are all together it corresponds to the word three so it can help it is at this very first step but then otherwise um, its role is rather minor, I would say. Um, sometimes if you want to count very quickly a collection, then maybe you can see, oh, there are three here, two here, three there. So it makes eight. Or sometimes for when you want to add little sets, you can group them if you have good subitizing abilities. Otherwise, you have to count them one by one. Mm -hmm. But in mathematical classes, it is not very often required. Yes, yes, that's fantastic. Um, so let's talk about a little bit more about what helps then with that magnitude. Um, I don't know who whoever wants to to attack that one. So mm -hmm. teaching those students, you know, the semantics of mathematics, the yeah. understanding the so, numbers. My point of view, and which is shared with other researchers, is that the one of the main difficulties of children with this calculia is to access the meaning of symbolic numbers. Symbolic numbers is the numbers that you have learned through your culture. So it's Arabic numbers, Roman numbers, number words, and so on. Uh, to quickly understand the magnitude that correspond to that. And for these children, at first, it's difficult to understand that three is three, that 19 is 19, and so on, the base 10 system, but then the rational numbers, the, fra the fraction, the decimals, and so on. All the, the universe of uh, the numbers is quite complex for them to understand. And I, there is not a much study about that, but I would say that probably also all the math language in general uh, also the understanding the, the numerical operations, the, the symbols like P, uh, like uh, all these mm -hmm. um, mathematic vocabulary is also challenging for these children. Absolutely. And Giannis, you mentioned you have dyslexia and you liked mathematics, but I would imagine you had to do quite a bit of work to get around some of your difficulties because mathematics can be language heavy. So what have you found to be effective for learning some of those language heavy tasks and keeping procedural tasks in mathematics straight? Um, since uh, I was lucky that I, I didn't know that I have dyslexia, so I was that I was a normal. So that's why I compensate that I think it's normal for someone to uh, don't learn by road the timetables, for example. I never learned by road. I, I wasn't able, but I use, you know, the reasoning skills. So to do uh, six times uh, eight, for example, I said that it's the fifth eight are 40, 40 plus eight is 48. I, and I proceed very, very quickly. And I thought this was a normal. Mm. So for the very beginning, I focus on the reasoning and mathematics and um, I couldn't learn um, even the, the proofs of the theorems and all this. I, I couldn't learn them by rote, but I, I, I know how to, uh, to get it uh, using um, uh, the identities and the properties of uh, mathematics. So uh, I think that there are many dyslexics, for example, that their problem are the memory and the procedural memory and all this. Uh, the, 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 the special educators, they focus a lot on explicit uh, instruction. And this is not the proper way for those students, because even if you have an explicit instruction, they have to follow the steps. So they overload the memory and they, they don't focus on the, on the reasoning and how they can uh, have a deep understanding. Mm -hmm. So that's why in our book, we propose um, uh, different approaches. Of course, an explicit instructor, it's a, a main um, um, uh, uh, way of intervention for this, this calculics, but for other students that they have a problems, in, uh, memory problems or procedural problems or attention problems, 
um, it's better to focus on deep understanding and trying them to think and uh, make the connection and compensate the memory problems. Mm. How I um, I compensate. And I think the problem is, um, uh, the main problem is the training of the special education teachers. Uh, some of them, they are they are afraid mathematics. They are not uh, very good educated to, to teach mathematics. And they just, uh, you know, deliver explicit instruction procedures and uh, do again and again the stuff. And I think it's um, it's not a proper way of uh, doing uh, mathematics for such um, um, uh, students. Sure. Uh, uh, some of them are very bright and they can find very, very quick and uh, very smart solutions. But we don't give them all these um, uh, opportunities and teach them in an explicit way. Absolutely. So you're saying it would be better to teach them bigger ideas and how the pieces and parts work so that they understand the big picture of mathematics, but also the how the components inside work so they can reason in a way that makes sense to their brain. Yeah, um, yeah. Okay. Yes, yes. I agree with that. That's really, really good. Um, so I would love to talk about uh, a little bit about your test, Giannis. I found it, I was just doing more research. I was reading your book and I, Math Pro S, I want to go check out this assessment. So can you talk a little bit more about this assessment, why you wanted to create it? Because as I was reading it, I was getting really excited because there is not is very many assessments that are going in the path that you are. Um, I want that data for our students at Made for Math. So will you share a little bit more about that test? Yeah, the math protest is a, is a battery that I developed um, uh, with Marie Pascal. So the full version consists of uh, 18 um, uh, uh, tasks. Um, uh, that uh, There are tasks that we measure the um, ANS that Marie Pascal uh, um, talked earlier, the subitizing and all these pure um, uh, uh, measure. Uh, but also there are other tasks that... Um, based um, uh, mainly in memory, like a factory retrieval, for example, on some reasoning tasks that are like a pattern, some visual special tasks like number lines and um, all this. We have categorized, uh, although we know that some overlapping and some more complicated tasks, there are many different cognitive skills that um, uh, intervene. So this is the full version of, of the task. And... Um, and then recently we developed um, using uh, IRT, um, uh, item response theory, using this uh, methodology, we make uh, the short version because the, the, the clinician and the um, uh, expert asks for us something, a, a shorter version that is very, very fast and quick. And so we can assess many children as a screening tool that can be uh, used in, in a school. And those students that are identified at risk can take them a full version by an expert that can then can build um, an, a proper intervention, individualized uh, intervention program. So, so far we offer um, the short version uh, in Greek. Mm -hmm. um, we have standardized this uh, um, uh, battery in, in French, uh, in um, uh, Flemish uh, language in uh, Italian and uh, in English mm -hmm. um, and hope the next month to release also this uh, language and anyone can want to use it it's online and everything is automatized so can get the reports and um, have the mathematical profile of the of each student and then can proceed to the intervention Oh, I love that. I think that's such a great tool. My sister is like a head of a school, the principal, and she was talking about how difficult it is to assess a large group of kids and really find who is struggling. So I'm excited to share this option with her because this is a big focus for her school this year. And I think a lot of educators are probably going to hear that and be excited about it because time is of the essence. A short test, yes, I love that. Makes it easier to really hone in on which students are going to need help. That's exciting. So as you get more versions available, Yanis, keep us up to date. We'll update links down below in the post of this video so that people can stay in touch because I want to support the work you two are doing. This is so exciting. 
Um, it's just, it, yeah, exhilarating to see the tools that we need are being made. And so thank you for doing that work. I just really appreciate it. Um, before we go, is there anything else you want to discuss and chat about um, regarding these students and what we can do as a community to help them? I wanted to say something, but um, more about the specificity of the book. Mm -hmm. um, being in the research field, uh, I see many books that are very theoretical, very um, uh, based on research, and sometimes they want to um, impact the clinical field, but they are so far from the reality that it's nearly funny to see uh, what they propose. And uh, on the other side, you can find books where uh, there are plenty of exercises for the children and so on, but there is nearly no, theoretical, no theoretical background. And here our goal was really to make the bridge between the two. Because if you want to um, remediate uh, a child with uh, learning difficulties, you need first to understand how this castle of cards is built in a typical children. What does the errors of the child tells you about the mechanism that goes wrong into that child? And then after that, you, you can build your remediation, but you need to have all this theoretical background. And yeah. then you have to have proposition of exercise and so on, but see how to build them in a specific order. Uh, according to the difficulty level, according to the developmental pathway that is typical in a child. Yes. And that was really the aim of this book. And I think it's really a, a unique signature of this book to really make this bridge up to the point where a, remedious, a remediation program is proposed step by step. Yes, absolutely. And that's what I really appreciate. It's such a good resource for us as we continue to develop lessons and we can look at the book and make sure we're proposing something that actually helps and then watch the progress of the students. So we've been using it a lot and I just get really excited about it. Um, do you two have any plans to create a video course based on your book? Yeah, this. Yeah, we have already started this and um, um, we make uh, videos using animations and um, there are some, uh, we, we call them e-workbooks, so they are uh, e-books and there are, in there, there are forms, so they can fulfill the forms in a digital way, so they can send uh, the student to the, even um, uh, to, to their coaches uh, online. Mm -hmm. And um, in each uh, worksheet, there is a QR code so they can uh, access with their phone or just click on them and see the videos and see all the methods. Um, uh, the problem is that it's too hard to do all these videos. So to do one ebook, it takes a lot, a lot of hours. Oh, yes. And uh, to using you know, the, 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 the right um, uh, uh, words and uh, the animation, it takes uh, a lot of time. So we have a upload already one in English. So I suppose the next month we'll have a lot of stuff uh, uh, in English. So the idea is to offer this to the people and to the child without have, um, without, without have to train a teacher. So the mm -hmm. student can see the videos by themselves or the teacher can see the video and understand um, uh, everything and give it a lot of resources to do you know, the, the, the practice. Mm. So we have already started this and um, Hope Marie Pascal uh, translate them in French. And <laughs> <laughs> that would be great. Yes, yeah. we'll link to those too. And as the, there's more options and versions available, we'll update the posts so that people can be aware of the options that are out there. I love that. That's such a great project. And I can relate. I know when I've made animated videos, three minutes can take upwards of 10 to 20 hours to create. So yeah. it's a lot of time. It's expensive. And uh, thank you for doing that work. I'm really excited about it. 
All right. So as you know, on this show, we always like to end with a joke or a pun or something along those lines. Giannis, Marie, do either of you have a fun joke you want to share with us? Yes, I like this one. A kid said to his math teacher, to show you how good I am in fractions, I only did half of my homework. And I think it's very cute. (laughs) Very cute. And I think it's very reminiscent of a child with dyslexia. They're some of the most creative thinkers. I could see that coming out of many of my students' mouths. How about you, Janos? Do you have a joke? Yeah, I have some joke from uh, students of um, for secondary education uh, that trying to take exam to enter the university. So trying to understand the complicated, you know, concept in mathematics. They trying to find a logic and um, find a solution and some of uh, the answers are really really very funny because we can understand it's very you know obvious that they don't understand nothing at all but they're trying to do something for example it's very often when they do uh, a calculus and trying to estimate a limit and mm-hmm. sometimes you know you have the limit and x tends to uh, tends to eight and the answer is um, uh, infinity. So they see the eight and then the infinity. So they and they 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 can understand that okay uh, uh, they the eight uh, you rotate the eight and you have the infinity. So when they have a, 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 an x ten to five, they trying to write the five in a horizontal way, which is very funny. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and we can understand at least that those children they don't have visual special problems because they are able to rotate the vibe. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. I love that. That's so funny. Um, so will you each of you share where we can find you? Giannis, where should we connect with you online? Excuse me, I didn't catch you. Where should we connect with you online? Uh how you can find me, you mean? Yeah, what's the best way to find you? Um, um uh, email me um, through the um, uh, university mail or the math pro uh, email we are very quick to respond and there are many many people that ask uh, uh, help about uh, you know intervention in mathematics or assessment so through the math pro education uh, yes we are typically uh, it takes one two days to respond so yeah awesome that sounds great and marie where can we find you well, if you want to find me, you can send me an email, uh, but also you can write my name on the web and you will find many of my papers and articles uh, um, available. Yes, yes. Last night I put your name into YouTube and I saw lots of videos as well. If you speak French, you'll know what she's saying. I could <laughs> follow the counting, but I couldn't follow much else. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for being here and for sharing all of your knowledge with us. My friends know that I have a math book addiction. So many of them have great ideas and good research, but I'm often left with the feeling of, now what? Exactly how do you teach this? That's why when the Made for Math team set out to write books, we wanted to make sure we didn't leave readers feeling like they needed more. You can get a copy of Math Facts to Memory and be explicitly instructed on how to teach students to add and subtract within 1 and 10. It's a multi-sensory approach and is perfect for parents, special ed, or any professional that does pull out tier 2 and 3 intervention for students with math learning differences. Inside, you'll find the latest research, tons of games, vocabulary sheets, and detailed instructions on how to guide students. Pick up your copy at shop.madeformath.com.